It was <laughs> our, also our idea to engage here a debate, um, which for us is, uh, for many of us, I think is um, kind of necessary to engage a debate. Don't laugh, Marcus, please. <laughs> <laughs> On, on this uh, subject, which is a very, I also suffered a lot, uh, which is for me a very, I mean, which is a very difficult subject for architects, I, I think. <clears throat> it is both. It is very difficult because it needs, as um, um, Eberstadt, uh, Rudolf Eberstadt said, who, who wrote a f very important book on the question of land, he said it needs skills in economy and in administration and we are not always very brilliant in these two fields. So I, I, I think it's very um, difficult. At the same time, it is essential for the production of space. So, <clears throat> so first of all, let me say um, some some words on this question of land, which is maybe it's an, it's a weird that where the translators proposed this I don't know question of land. We said also in the this this for this issue it was called the property issue. So in German Bodenfrage, in French it is super <coughs> um, more let's say formal or more juridic as a question foncière. And, um, and this issue is as old as humans being are not nomads anymore. And um, I, would, I would like to start with a couple of um, um, reflections on, on this uh, subject. So um, starting with the Old Testament, <coughs> in the Bible it is written, the, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. I mean, until today, I think the church doesn't sell any land. <laughs> and, uh, and 350 before Christ, I think our students from Hong Kong are there, so I talk about their uh, authority. Shang Yang from the state of Jing distributes land to the peasants and introduces land taxation. So 350 before Christ. This is the origin of land equalization in which the state issues rights of use that are categorically not to be traded. So land is not, this time in China, um, an object that you can, should or could trade with. The accumulation of land and power by aristocrats is thus curbed. Then, something else that you all know, this word of Stadtluft macht frei, 1218, town privileges of Bern. Louder? Okay. <clears throat> so every person who comes to this place and wants to remain should sit and linger freely. Or in short, city air makes you free. Stadtluft macht frei. So in towns and cities, the power of manualism is broken. And much later, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in his Discours sur l'inégalité, there's this super famous uh, sentence, you are all lost if you forget that the fruits of the earth belong to all and the earth to no one. For Rousseau, monopoly on land is the reason for social inequalities. Therefore, land and the whole earth should not be private property. Maybe a last very important event that you all know, I guess, the so-called enclosure of the commons. Who knows the enclosure of the commons? My students, anybody? Okay, I should explain it then. So it starts basically in England in the, in the 17th century, and before that, British farmers planted their crops on small strips of land while allowing their animals to graze on common fields, shared collectively. In the 70s, 1700s, the British Parliament passed, passed legislation referred to as the Enclosure Acts, the so-called Enclosure Acts, which allowed the common areas to become privately owned. This led to wealthy farmers buying up large sections of land in order to create larger and more complex farms. 
Ultimately, this forced small farmers off of their land, having lost their way of life. Many of these farmers went to local towns and cities in search of work. So this is, of course, super important. And Marx, Karl Marx, says this is the beginning of the agrarian revolution, and it's also the thriver of, um, of the industrial in, uh, in, um, in, uh, revolution. And Marx himself calls this land grabbing. So interestingly enough, oh yeah, that was the image. I mean, it's not that uh, it's not that evident to show images related to the subject, which is also not evident for architects. So interestingly enough, the biggest wave of privatization of land started right after Rousseau's critique with the French Revolution. So where the liberté was more powerful as the égalité. And in, um, in Haussmann's proje project, which is, of course, a modernization of Paris, and, and of course it is, as Henri Lefebvre said, it's, uh, of course, to, you know, for better defense or against re further revolutions, but it's basically a huge speculative project, state-driven, and, I mean, in 1850s, so or when he started, he started in 1851, Paris counted one million inhabitants, and in 1875, so when Hausmann has changed completely, and I think it's super interesting to see this, because it changes the granularity of the city, as well as with the enclosure of commons, where you s the small granularity of agriculture has been transformed into this big kind of scale of agriculture, and in the city it was the same. And, um, and at the end, in 1875, Paris, so we always talk about growth in Luxembourg, Paris counted 2.7 million inhabitants. And of course, located in these uh, way bigger blocks, and they expropriated. Uh, so it was a state-driven uh, um, speculation. They expropriated the, 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 the home owners and um, speculated and financed the whole modernization via a new bank that they created and uh, at the end it failed. In terms of financing, it failed. Anyway, just also maybe more or less at the same time, a little bit later, Serda who came to Paris to, to study Paris and to develop this with a completely different um, ambition, much more social ambition, uh, maybe you don't, you all know Barcelona, of course, and we all enjoy going there for these, for these um, perimeter blocks, but in Cerda's projects, they were not perimeter blocks. It was like um, already a kind of an application of the kind of a slab typology, as you see here um, in, in this uh, perspective. So sometimes it was a kind of, a, you know, two slabs uh, uh, opposite each other, sometimes like this, sometimes in L shape, sometimes in O, U. But the idea was that the landscape is continuous. It's kind of a to topological landscape running through the whole city as a public space. The idea architecturally <coughs> was also to offer more or less the same, so opposite to Hausmann, more or, or, or less the same um, quality of life for every inhabitant. And completely to this respect, O also failed, because at the end, I will not go too much into detail, but at the end, um, because he wanted to keep this, and at the end, of course, all the real estate industry came in and they densified and transformed it as we know it today. So more or less at the same moment also, we are now in the 19th uh, century, <coughs> 61, um, James Hobrecht, uh, who before uh, was an engineer of the canalization in Berlin, he um, um, developed this plan of the extension of Berlin, and that is also the, maybe the most important example of speculation in the urban realm. Um, he um, there were the so-called Terrain-Gesellschaften, so companies that prepared the plots um, 
and and it is interesting to see that James Hoprecht's plan was he tried to adapt it on the morphology of the agricultural fields in order not to change too much the existing morphology, but that only for economic reasons, of course. And <clears throat> then the plots so were sold from the farmers to these Terrangesellschaften. They prepared the plots and then they sold it to the developers and the developers uh, densified, as you can see, and this, this was a kind of a, a current situation with different courtyards. Most of the population were living in courtyards. And, um, and that was a situation which, at the end of the 19th century, many thinkers and basically architects wanted to struggle with. Um, and there were, like, re reformists in the question of land, in the question of housing, in all these diff different fields. So it's a very, very old issue, actually. But it has, of course, gained momentum with the neoliberal turn. I love, I love this image that we found uh, when we did the research for, for this book. <coughs> Sorry. And, um, and I love it because in the beginning, of, of course, it was an interesting move that the uh, inhabitants of social housing became the owners of their social housing, but it, they killed almost the whole stock of social uh, housing. And, um, and there was very <coughs> weird moments also that the um, uh, housing units became privatized and the collective space was still collective space, but nobody took care anymore of these spaces. So anyway, so financialization, Markus has written a lot on this uh, subject. It's of course that, let's say, the finance industry got, is getting more and more important uh, um, against, in a way, the real economy. And in our field is, of course, these um, investment funds that start to dominate the market, um, that enter into this um, uh, market of uh, real estate and, and land. Uh, and, um, but not only these huge investment funds that ha don't have any relationship anymore with different projects, but also, um, for example, in Berlin, it's a very important issue, is these family offices, right? Of, let's say, very important companies that invest now in this, that enter into this market. And everybody, almost everybody, ourselves, if we, you know, try to become also, in a way, speculators. So René de Graaf, for example, he said, if you see my generation, my friends, um, almost the same age, almost the same education, almost more or less the same, let's say, level of, of profession, the divide, the social divide, whether they are in a way have a good life or a complicated life, is if they bought themselves their apartment in the 90s or not. That was the main decision. So, um, so this vague of privatization, I will not go too much into this um, uh, development in the 80s, 90s, but just to give you one example that I know quite well. So you know those projects, of course. Super important. They are UNESCO World Heritage. The famous Siedlungen, you know, it's so important in every history, uh, book on the history of architecture. And, um, and um, famous for a, a, a public investment into housing. And what happened? They are, have all been privatized. They have all been bought by um, different um, investors. So this is indeed a problem. And when it comes to Luxembourg, I mean, these are photos. I mean, you can take them everywhere, in every commune, what happens there, you know? This kind of destruction, so there was a single family house before, which was kind of ugly. But what they will build there, you know, when you see this, that's what we see everywhere. And my, I mean, I think that it is related to this question of land as the 
architecture almost has no value. It's basically the land that is super expensive in a way. So we see this everywhere in the country. And, um, and, and so the question of land in a way is related to the concentration or monopoly of ownership of land about privatization of benefits, whereas, and this is something I will come to later on, that's the so-called Henry George um, um, theorem, whereas the community creates the value. This is what is, makes it so complicated and so political. So we, and we worked uh, deeply on this uh, Luxembourg in, in transition call and did, that is one of the basic problems that people who come into the country because there's this growth rate of 2% so we almost have to build a new Bettenburg but we, are, we can't and we are not because of the question of land. So people move more and more in the hinterland and commute to Luxembourg City. Today, almost half of the people who work in Luxembourg City come from transborder areas. And uh, so the question of land is not only um, a social, but it's also, in a way, an ecological sit uh, issue because 50% right, of the greenhouse gas emissions are related to mobility. And also, this is something I will come back on this subject later, that um, the, 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 the soil, because there are two different, let's say, meanings, the land, which I'm talking about today, but also the soil related to this, is extremely important for the socio-ecological or for this ecological transition. So this is something I always show when I'm uh, somewhere like in the Bialage Institute, I show this because I get, I don't know why, but I get these ads from, um, what is it again? Sotheby's. It's like Daimler, Daimler Benz, they invested in real estate in the beginning of the 90s. I mean, they have to produce cars and not invest in real estate. And Sotheby's, I didn't know. I thought it was like art merchants, but apparently they are also in the real estate. And I get these ads and they are more and more absurd. This one is like two or three years ago. Uh, today I got one for a house, uh, 2.7 million in, uh, even not in Bel Air, it was outside from Luxembourg City. And this is something I showed to, um, and what is also interesting, when I used to live in Paris, I thought it's incredible, the real estate price. And now I returned two years ago to Paris, I walked through the Marais, and I was not shocked anymore. <laughs> I was not shocked anymore. I heard that Diffadange, where we live, is the same price like in Barcelona. Come on, I mean Diffadange. So here is something that is something, you know, we, if you want to buy this flat, okay, 545,000 euros. I always say, um, I mean, look at this, I mean, look at this photo. Tiles, of course, tiles everywhere here in the flats, tiles, PVC window, uh, probably here the, the, the bedroom, a small kitchenette, and probably, I hope that nobody lives in this flat, <laughs> uh, and probably a bathroom somewhere hidden without a window, right? So, but yeah. seriously, huh? And the garage. I don't, I'm not, uh, no, it was not in the ad that there's a garage. I'm not sure, but 450. 545,000 euros. So when you go to the bank, it depends, of course, on the formula. But let, let's say you have to pay it off. I don't know. Let's say over 20 years, you pay about 1,500, 2,000 euros every month. So if you are young and you work, so you have to earn three times what you pay off, right? So if you want to pay off. 2,000 euros, you have to earn 6,000 euros. If I earn 6,000 euros, so let's say I'm, I'm a banker or I'm working in the management of Amazon, do I really want to live there? Or I start my existence, you know, with a family. What happens then? Where to go? So this is, therefore, I always say, can it get worse? So it is worth to look in the history of the land reform. 
And there are many, many important books that I can recommend. And the, you know, from Henry George to Hans Bernoulli, I will not talk about today about Hans Bernoulli, but this is a very, very good book. Um, to, and what is interesting that in 2015, 16, 17, the discourse on architecture and urbanism started again to get interested, to, in, in, to be interested in the subject. So it's also a, a matter for our uh, discourse. So there are two, let's say, theories in the land reform. Those are the most important protagonists, I would say, as land reformists. Henry George, Progress and Poverty, 1879, which was at this time the most widely read book next to the Bible. And uh, according to George, it is interesting because he transports the question from the, let's say, rural environment to the urban environment. And he says, social grievances were caused by the monopolization of land and natural treasures by a selfish minority. He believed that all people should have the same natural right to access to the resources of the earth. What, this, what was the um, outcome of the Lysa study? 12 or 13 companies and families own 60% of the land in Luxembourg, right, city? So the so-called Henry George theorem, according to which rents of land are generated by provision of public services. Therefore, the provision of public services should be financed by the rents of land. Okay, so makes sense, right? And uh, it was interesting because Henry George was against expropriation, he was still American, uh, but the collectivization of rent of land. So he developed this concept of single tax. And this is really beautiful. I mean, single tax, the idea that there should be only one tax, only a tax on land. And what is so interesting about this is that it is linked to the quality of labor, you know? Imagine we would reduce the tax on labor, on work, and increase it on land. And you can say, okay, it's, it's, it's too, super uh, theoretical, but recently a Swiss deputy of the Swiss parliament, she calculated it, in, for Switzerland, and if you had, if you would, if you applied, four percent of the whole uh, real estate park in Switzerland, you can abolish all the other taxes. So it would be worth to think about this also in Luxembourg. The other guy is Silvio Gesell, also very interesting. He was in a way more radical. They were very close somehow, but more radical, and he went for expropriation. He was against also speculation, how to abolish speculation. So he had different concepts, also the free money uh, and the free land, frei Geld, frei Land. And so expropriation, collectivization of land, which in return should be distributed through ground leases, Erbaurecht, Amphitheos, to avoid speculation. So just to say, this is not my position, okay? To be clear, I'm not for expropriation, okay? I'm not for expropriation. <laughs> so another two very important protagonists. Adolf Damaschke on the left, super important, and he proposed a couple of measures. One measure, and I will come back on this, because this is for me the, let's say, basement of all land reform. First one is taxation. So we talked about it. Taxation, I would say, two different kinds of taxation. One on land, in general. If possible, more on unbuilt land, undeveloped land. And the second one is when unbuilt land is transformed into buildable land, then it should also be taxed, right? 
And um, this, is, this is one thing. The second one is a commune, public land, a commune has to have a certain amount of land in its, as its, its property. This is super important. And then giving um, ground leases to leaseholders, which could be developers, individuals, whatsoever. But this is somehow something way more, where you have a more impact on the social development of the commune. So this is super important. How to get into, how to get into the possession of land? Preemption. But, um, so that was a quote I wanted to give you. The problem is that, because it exists also in Luxembourg, but sometimes it's so absurd to buy it that, um, that this is maybe not always the right um, tool. Anyway, I don't find the quote anymore. So that the commune owns a lot of land. This is super important. The third very important um, aspect of a land reform is you have to stimulate and to make possible cooperatives, self-organized housing projects. This is extremely important. And we will debate on this because there is no one today in Luxembourg. I think there is a potential, but this is something I thought we would be more around the table to discuss it, but we can also discuss it like this. So this is extremely important. Cooperatives, taxation, and communal land. So Hans Sochen Vogel died, I think, last year or two years ago, based, grounded his <coughs> um, land reform on this Damaschkin um, uh, idea, but he was in a, in a different position. He was mayor of Munich in the 60s, and he um, was confronted to a situation where he saw that the poorer population was pushed more and more outside of the city, and that there was no almost or less public land anymore in the city where there was a big pressure on the development of the land. So he said, how can we access the land? And he distinguished between two rights. He wanted to split it and he said, how do you translate it? Verfügungsrecht und Nutzungsrecht. So that the public authority should should have the right of disposal of the land and then giving indeed um, um, ground leases to third parties. So the tricky thing is how to transfer it into public hands, right? So that was the tricky part and therefore he never succeeded implementing uh, this reform. But this is this is extremely important. What is the kind of architectural and urbanistic vision behind this land reform is that we have a social mix in the city that, um, Emmanuel, you talked about the right to the city and that the right to the city is there, right? In short, in a way. And that this social democratic vision at this time was that people could live in the city and rent their apartment. Whereas the other strategy, the conservative liberal, let's say, ideal, that dominated also the history of Luxembourg, is that most of the inhabitants, ideally all the inhabitants, own a piece of land, own a flat. So bringing the population into ownership. And that is, of course, urbanistically, the consequence is sprawling of the city into the landscape. <clears throat> so learning from, maybe let me just tell you, and I know that it's very critical to say learning from, but I think we can learn from, but also it has its limits. So learning from Vienna, 
um, everybody is talking about, every mayor wants to go to Vienna and see how, uh, how it works. And, okay, 62% of the population in Vienna lives in communal housing units and pay, pay a rent between five and nine euros. But how did it start? Does anybody know the beginning of this story? The beginning is super interesting. It started after World War I when the, the um, rents were still high, people were so poor, they could not afford living in the city and were pushed outside of the city. They called themselves the settlers. They went into the Wiener, Wiener Wald, Vienna Forest, and they started to build their huts. And then later on, it's also interesting for the architects, Adolf Loos and so on, went there to, to told them you know, how to design beautiful huts and so on. And the social democratic government said, we have to bring back our population and we have to, you know, also allow people to live in the city anymore. So what did they do? They increased the tax on land in a very harsh way. And the owners of the land lords had to sell their land to the commune. So there it was a kind of a, it was a kind of an expropriation without expropriate, right? So there was a huge transfer of the land into the um, ownership of the, of the public and of the commune. And why in the city? This is also in, in important. Why the city? Because if you talk about the, you know, and the consequence then were the super blocks and so on, you know, but why? urban, why in the city? That is also interesting. Because the commune didn't even have the money to develop infrastructures outside of the money. So they, they had to base the new project of the Red Vienna Rouge on existing infrastructures. Okay, another lesson is Amsterdam. So we went, when we prepared the book, we went to see the head of development of the city of Amsterdam. Amsterdam owns, the city of Amsterdam owns 85% of its land. Okay, they have changed a little bit recently. They changed the leasehold contracts. It's complicated, but I don't want to, to, to go too much into detail. But 85% still is in ownership of the, the commune, even bankers, you know, rent the land and uh, for their beautiful Trachtenhäuser. And um, when they develop a new project, whether it's a private investment or public investment, they develop, and that is the rule, 40% of social housing, 40% in the mid-segment, what we call affordable housing, and 20% is for the free market. Another example, and we will um, have the, um, as a guest Elisabeth Merck, the director of the urban development of the city of Munich. Um, it's the so-called SOBON, Sozialgerechte Bodennutzung, so social just use of land, implemented in 1994 by Christiane Talgott, tradition of Hans-Jochen Vogel in the city. And what does it mean? First of all, very important, <clears throat> and that is something you all like. First of all, a developer has, it's, it's an obligation up as, uh, in a certain scale of the project, has to launch an architectural competition, mandatory. Then pay also most of the part of the infrastructures, technical infrastructures, social infrastructures, kindergarten, schools, and so on. Then, for every project, and that was a big debate at this time, you know, what, we, what do we do, do, shall we act like, you know, in, in, in France, where the social housing is outside of the city, you know, this ghettoization, or shall we include it in the city? So they said, if there is a development, whether it is, again, private or public, but most of all, private development, 30% of Geförderte Wohnungsbau, social housing. Mandatory for all developers, 30%. Now they increased it to 40%. And 
Everybody accepted it because it was for everybody. There was no exception. And that is like the, like the mosaic, you know, that created this kind of, um, and you will all say, yeah, but Munich is also, there's also gentrification in Amsterdam and so on and so forth. It's true, but it's, I think, ex extremely important. You could also mention Ulm, for example, um, always realizing the preemption uh, uh, for a uh, hundred years. Basel, for example, Basel, super, super important, Basel, the referendum. There was a referendum and the majority of the inhabitants voted for that no public land should be sold anymore. I think this gave, gives it much more power. So the problem of the learning from, as you all know, is that we don't have these traditions and that we just cannot say, okay, let's go, you know? It's, unfortunately, it's not possible. So let me give you a draft of a possible land uh, reform. First one, I think taxation. I think it's important, but it should be also a coherent kind of a land reform, not only a single measure, but it should be a whole program. So taxation is important. I said it already, it should be on the, uh, on the, on the land, unbuildable more than the the built land, there is this debate also in Germany, <coughs> and, uh, and uh, maybe the other one, the other taxation is not necessary anymore when it comes, you will see later, when it comes to no land take, then we don't need the other one anymore. So the second one is communalize in a way, so increase the amount of land. We learned, for example, when we did this exhibition, in 2018, um, it was um, 8. Point, so it was 8.5 or 8. No, sorry, 8.9 or 8 altogether, including the public funds. Uh, eight, and now it's 13. But the communes didn't inc almost didn't increase. Neither state its uh, public uh, land reservoir, but the funds, right? Basically, the funds. So what are they going to do with it? That's the big question. Um, so it is important, I think, to increase it, but what are you going uh, to, to do with, with this? So this is, I think, very important that the preemption, that is a debate, but it's difficult to implement, should be somehow limited. Because sometimes it's really absurd to what price they pay you know, we, we, they have to invest to that to, to, in order to transfer the land into public ownership. Another, I think, also part of this is more than necessary is um, that there is a relationship, strong relationship, and I think we, we, everybody tries to work on this between the housing issue and the land spatial development. I think that was also, there was also an important split between them for, more, for many decades. And of course, the reform of communal autonomy, one of the main problems. So especially with regard to the accumulation of mandates of many mayors. Anyway, regulation. I think this is super important because the regulation is was always part of the, you know, I've shown you the image of, from Berlin. In Berlin, there was no regulation. The only rule was that the courtyard should be at least five times five meters in order that the charrette, the, the firemen could turn their charrette in the courtyard. But that was the only rule. So this is something that has, it's the only aspect that has really been implemented since. We are maybe over regulated <laughs> now. We have too many rules probably. Sometimes it's inflationary and even somehow contradictory. Um, but um, I, I think we have to change the regulations drastically. And I think that was, I, I hope that is one of the outcomes of Luxembourg in transition is this, this um, old um, like um, um, zoning plans. I mean, we cannot, I mean, production and 
um, housing could be, can almost always be combined again, you know? And this is really something I, I think we have to think about it. And then this uh, rule that Amsterdam adopts, that Munich adopts, that many, many community, uh, that many, many communes adopt, we should always think about it. I think 10% of affordable housing is not enough. I think we should increase it to uh, 30% at least and also try to stimulate, and that is the next uh, aspect, I think, co cooperatives. Why is it not possible to have a cooperative here? I mean, this is, this is I think, um, for me, the cooperatives are the expre ultimate expression of emancipation of our times, of the liberal kind of emancipation, because they are self-organized. But a cooperative needs privileged access to land from the commune, otherwise it cannot exist. So if the lessor asks the cooperative to pay off the whole uh, amount, there's no cooperative. So this is something we really have to think about it. And um, yeah. And the fifth one, and this is something we, I would love to debate with you, is the stop land take, no, land, no more land take. So whether it is net land take or, or gross land take, but I think this is something, you know, when you see this small country and you see the competition of the different land uses, and I'm biking there when I go to the university, and this has appeared over the last four years there, you know? And, and, and you see the agriculture is more and more shrinking, and these kinds of weird developments are getting more and more powerful. So I think this is something in every square meter of natural soil counts. And that was our bet, in a way, for Luxembourg in transition, that we have enough sealed land that we should use. So here I refer to the change in terms of regulations, in terms of zoning plans, land use plans. We really have to change them, make them more simple. So we can use these areas. And uh, so this was, that was one of the, of the propositions for Luxembourg in transition. So imagine that we um, just, you know, divide the, the periphery, so if we succeed in implementing sufficiency in mobility, if we succeed in removing the car out of most of the cities, if we succeed in mixing these monofunctional areas, then we might use many of these areas. We always said uh, Fritz has 6,200 parking lots, you know. And they are so, I mean, it's, it's land, it's 1,000 euros per square meter just for cars. I mean, what can you do it? How can you use it? And if, and the, the developers, they are already interested in these areas. So we should think about how to use them alternatively. And that was one of the, the idea that we can say, okay, what if we can here divide it in small plots and then we can say, okay, there's the, the leasehold right, and then let's try to stimulate cooperatives and uh, other participative um, housing <coughs> projects, and we could change it. We could, it's just, I, it's like um, uh, yesterday I, I, I watched a, um, a debate between um, uh, Bruno Latour and Schellenhuber, and Schellenhuber was, I mean, you can think of him what you want, but. He just said, it's possible, it is possible. We should not say that the transition is not possible. It is possible, but we have to think really drastically different, uh, in a different way. Also, what is important in the question of land now becomes much more important is this idea, and I just would like to quote Louis Kahn. So an architect I think we all admire. And Louis Kahn said once, a city could be a place where you can preserve an open space as such without cutting it down in size because the land is too expensive. You shouldn't have to take the price of land into account or you shouldn't have to ask whether it is reasonable to build a playground in the middle of a city or to build, you know, a park or whatever. And this is Esch, for example, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the biggest heat islands in the, in the area and of course the 
ship launch in, in, in Belval, uh, yeah, Belval here, and, and, and Terre Rouge, and so on. So Red Luxembourg, and, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and this is something really I, I think is also now more, getting more and more important to, when it comes to the question of land. Okay, so now the last question, and honestly, this is the most tricky question. How does it change architecture and urbanism? Okay, so maybe just one, one because in the background you see this model, and you see that it's way higher. We should have opened the <laughs> ceiling. And uh, this, is, this is just a very beautiful project, because the Federal, so the Federal Reserve Bank um, was located in this uh, neo Renaissance building, and then they wanted to, you know, needed more space, and they had this plot. And uh, they said, okay, we have a huge um, program, right? At the same time, we want to offer to New York, which is, as you all know, besides the Central Park, a very dense city, uh, we want to offer them a free space. And Kevin Roach, so he experimented, there were many topological studies. I think they even changed the zone regulation plan after, after this project. And then he elevated it 50 meters, so exactly on this corniche of the neo-Renaissance, linked it, com connected it via um, a passerelle. And uh, then they started the excavation, and then the bank found an empty building somewhere, and they abandoned, unfortunately, this uh, very beautiful project. It's just, for me, it's just um, as symbolically important as it um, also expresses somehow our responsibility as an architect that even if we have a private client on a private plot, that we have to somehow try to also offer sometimes public uses, right? So this is, this is one of my fetish projects. It's not realized here in the, in, the, in the exhibition, but I think this is also extremely important, as this is built on, first of all, public land. And I, I like this idea, and it's interesting that the whole EBA Berlin is basically 80% of all the projects are through um, ground leases. Even the public housing companies have a leasehold uh, right on, on the... It's interesting because, fortunately, because those many, most of them have been privatized since, and the land is still in ownership of the city. But I think this is, so this is one of the, these uh, IBA projects, and you have the public land so of the municipality. You have a common structure, so this structure belongs to all the inhabitants, and then you have individual house. We had James Wines there last week, and you see the relationship, right? So public land, common structure, individual, private um, housing, unit, housing units, which could be very, very different uh, to each other. Certain density also. Okay, next to the tier garden and so on. So it's, I, I think also how, how do we design then the thresholds between these different dimensions. This is, so the question, does it change architecture and urbanism? Honestly, it's a very difficult question and I think most of the time probably no. Even if, I have to say, if 70% and up to 70%, it depends on the location, but up to 70% of the whole costs of a project are to pay to finance the land. So it's sometimes it's more, most of the time it's half of it, but sometimes it could even be up until 70%. Of course, then you reduce the budget for architecture somehow, right? Um, but this is a project, and we will have Tanya Hert, who uh, was an associate at um, Metron, who is also a cooperative, and they developed this. I mean, she, no, sorry, she did the urban design. So what happened here? That was an industrial uh, wasteland and um, Stiftung Habitat. This is also something we don't have in Luxembourg. So these kinds of associations that are super engaged in the social and ecological development of the city. So they bought this, a non-profit organization, they bought the land 
Then they ask Metron to do this urban design. You say, yeah, it's so conventional, you know? I mean, it, it is indeed super conventional. Okay, this was existing. This is a kind of a typical perimeter block, right? But then they develop these different projects with this community. And the community is a community of cooperatives. And they developed it from the beginning on with the users, future users of this site. And that changes, in my sense, everything. So then we also have Misha Spöri, partner of um, Pool Architekten, comes to, Lux, to Luca in, on the 21st of April. So this is part of this famous Mehr als Wohnen project. Um, I mean, I truly believe that if it's self-organized projects, you have a good quality of life. And you have also a good quality of architecture in it. And it's not only about housing question. It's true that what Adolf Damaschke said, the housing question is first of all a question of land, but it's also this project. So Daniel, Daniel Abram comes to Luxembourg um, on 3rd of May. You will also be there, Nori, right? And this is uh, an interesting thing that, you know, that, does anybody know this project, ex Ruta Print? No? Okay, so I have to explain. Okay, so that was a printing company. They um, got bankrupt uh, in the, uh, right after the fall of the wall. Then the city of Berlin bought the land. And then an investor from Iceland, came in and he wanted to buy this as part of a portfolio with 45 other real estate objects in Berlin. And meanwhile, there was a Berlin in the 90s temporary usage of this building by artists and the alternative scene. And they wanted to stay, of course. And it was super interesting because they were very much focused on labor. Not so much, they didn't live there. They were really trying to work with la on labor for the, for the neighborhood and so on and so forth. And then they didn't know what to do. They went to the press, they did a huge, started a big campaign in the press against the mean Heuschrecke, you know, and then they found two foundations in Switzerland, non-profit organizations. They bought it and then as lessors gave ground leases to this association, and they are now there, and it's absolutely fantastic. And you will see, you will see uh, the project in uh, a couple of weeks. So this is my last slide, and that's, that's the end, because at the end, I think, I mean, I'm always, I said it also last week, I think what is super important is these counter spaces. I think when we engage with the social ecological transition, we need those counter spaces. That was always important. Every change needs what Tafuri called counter spaces. And if everything is developed and gentrified, we don't have those counter spaces. So therefore also, I believe that the question of land is um, essential. And that's it, and now we can debate. Thank you very much. Mentalität.
Answer in English, I because the, I no because the answer I answer in English because the answer is I think should be given by the younger generation, and especially you know by all these new people who come into the country. And I think this mentality, this this is a very current argument, of course. I think that two things change. Um, Deeply. The first one is our relation to ownership in general. I think, I mean, we share much more things than I think than we used to be, and this is just the beginning. I, in my sense, it's just the beginning of a development. But the younger generation should, you know, I, I think this kind of sharing and less and less ownership is freeing also many, you know, things makes possible also many things. <laughs> I think the reduction of objects that belong to one is also in a way, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's not, so, I, I think the, this old classic idea of ownership, which in a way, you know, is referring to the ideal of liberalism, no, it's this idea that you know it's the emanc it's linked to this emancipation of the individual, right? Always defined by, you know, ownership. I think this is this model comes in a way, hopefully, maybe I'm too idea, but comes somehow over the next decades to an end. I truly believe this, but that's probably not us who will be the thriver of this. But I think there are new, I, and, and the second one is where I really not, where I'm really not, really don't agree with you, is let's maybe try a couple of prototypes. Can't we try one pilot project? I mean, a couple of prototypes, no? Yes. I think there's a, uh, thank you for the lecture, but I think there's an important piece missing, which of course you cannot fill in. That is, uh, strong political figures. And this means you can talk about measurements or measures measurements and, and uh, trying trying to get cooperatives going and all these things. But all the examples uh, from the recent past in some way or another are underpinned by very strong political figures. And let's say in the case of Luxembourg, if I look around, I don't see them at the moment. I'm going to be very blunt, just for the debate. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, not, it's not a judgment, it's an assessment. I don't see it. Um, uh, for sure in the administration there are very good, intelligent uh, people. They don't have the mandate. They don't have the mandate. And it's a kind of protocol, I think. So I think a really important part, and it's not something that you can put uh, uh, point blank on a table, that is... Um, yeah, that might change if half of the population have Sorry. the right. That might change if half of the population have the, has the right to vote on the national level. Not necessarily. I think so. No, I think it's 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 something you cannot control. It's, it boils down to almost personal ethical decisions of people in power, and you know either you're lucky. 
lucky or you're unlucky in a way? I mean, it's a kind of a gamble game. Uh, I mean, Luxembourg is probably lucky on many levels, but it's, I think it's deeply unlucky on, on that level, for instance. And then the question is, you know, how could you, of course, with pilot projects, for instance, or you could start to feed an imagination. You should start. To, yes. But that's not enough. No, no, that's not enough. We, many would say it's the, there shouldn't be, a, I mean, we are too late for pilot projects, but I don't agree with this. Emmanuel. No, and also, I think Nori, you should later on reply to yeah. Peter. <laughs> yes, Emmanuel. Thank you for a rich talk. You spoke about the double voice. The first one I didn't like at all, and the second one I think is the one that needs to be stressed. The first one is when you talk about a kind of cultural history of taxation and regimentation, and the other one is when you invoke architects and the architectural solutions they propose. Talking about tax and regimentation in a context like this one, I think is not going to uh, activate the people who are here because I I think almost nobody here is a tax expert. But the second line of thought is what activates every single one here, which is to say power away from the politicians back to the architects, and that's find the shovels, the towers, <laughs> etc. Absolutely. Because, because if the architects start dreaming again and start proposing solutions, the politicians will follow. What else would they do? And, and you know, the, the examples that you showed were all examples from um, contexts that within modern architecture were kind of uh, game changers. Uh, you, you know, Sharon was not just uh, anybody, but he was not a politician. No, but, Sha but, he but he, it was possible because yes. Martin Wagner, Martin Wagner was he, uh, but, but pushing it. But was, was architecture and not politics. And at the very end of your talk, you invoke Manfredo Caffrui, who is of course a monster. Uh, Manfredo Caffrui would have said, if you want to, you know, architects ultimately are uh, playthings of capital. But what do you do with that? You give up. I think we should say, power back to the architects, let's come up with fresh ideas, and the politicians will eventually follow when they see that it works. But, but maybe just uh, maybe one reply, Emmanuel. Because I'm I, I, I'm not sure whether we should have the you know the again the or again the you know too too much power neither, but what I think, what I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not for an overregulation. I think we are highly overregulated, and I'm not for more taxes. I'm for less taxes, less less taxation. But I want, I, and therefore I think it's highly political, because we have to. Economists like Ottmar Edenhofer, you know, they say taxation on land is socially just. It's makes econo ecologically sense and even economically. So I don't, I want to, I think it, we have to change from a highly unproductive sphere, which is, you know, land, land uh, rents, to uh, uh, something to, you know, to a productive, to transfer the money again to the productive sphere, which is labor. And so I don't want to, you know, I don't want to over more regulations or more taxations. I just want, I want less, actually, in both. Regulations, for example, I said less, 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 less. But we have to talk about what kinds of taxation and what kinds of regulations. Ah, yes, sorry. Yes. I just want to answer this uh, person. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a wish. and 
you wish that uh, in the next 10 or 20 years, much more land will be owned by public uh, a city, by a state. And I think this will happen. So in this case, uh, that's something, uh, the change will come. Uh, so I am um, in the city, uh, in the city board here in Luxembourg, and I see that the administration uh, does not want or is not able to uh, get enough public land. I take uh, an example not uh, far from uh, from here, Fulfamur. Fulfamur was an industrial location, uh, and it has been classified differently to be able to build houses. And uh, uh, the price of the land went up 20 times the price it was it had before. Yeah. So why is this possible? It is possible because we have no law that uh, can be applicated by the city uh, rulers. Another, by, another uh, example is Villaway Bok, same thing. All these industrial uh, sites. Uh, sites are transformed now, uh, are not, uh, how do you say, per silver. And nobody goes <laughs> against this, but this is. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, yeah. There was, I think. Uh, no, no, you, I, I totally agree. I'm not, I'm not pleading neither for um, um, a shift from, you know, private monopoly of land towards public or state monopoly of land, but communal, increasing the communal reservoir of land is extremely important, I agree. But you cannot, in your history of Luxembourg, you cannot have the principle changed fundamentally in 94. And there was a shift from private ownership that became a higher principle than public utility, utility duty. Why did the cities and the state not own more land? They had no money at that time. The ownership on the private sector was very high in high percentages. Why? because our steam company helped people to be owners of their houses and helped it a lot. Now, you cannot say we had no public action. We had Piavero who has taken the whole world of cash back. Otherwise, we would have uh, yeah. nothing. Yeah. So the private ownership was transferred to public. Yes, one and quarter of the land is by expropriation. I know uh, this. Political countries. And now, today, we are in a state where uh, we are helpless as the local authority is no longer able uh, to have the land. It has no longer the power to do it. And so far, the ownership is uh, growing and growing and. Uh, Perhaps your idea with taxation is the right one, but I, I wish you good luck. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> it's I'm not I'm my sure idea. There, no, he wanted to <laughs> say a word. Well, since this is a debate, uh, let me bring in another viewpoint. I'm taking the part of the boring moralist, someone has to do it. Today, we had, uh, yesterday, there was uh, a new report by the IPCC came out. The news in there were not new, but we know that uh, every day we get the news that we have limits on our planet, we have uh, physical limits, we have social limits. And we are in a state of crisis, not only because of the war now, but, but anyhow, there are many crises in the same time. So, on the question, um, should it be politicians, should it be investors, should it be architects who develop um, the ground? I don't think we 
are in a position anymore to be able to debate about egos of people. This exhibition is called Common Ground. So there is a common responsibility. There is only one way we have to solve these problems. And um, I believe that um, uh, some of those principles should be tested. Um, what will you tell it to your children afterwards uh, uh, in a couple of years? Well, we were stuck in our Luxembourg, was stuck in this, this history. Yes, this is, I mean, everything that has been said is true. It's not realistic to think about models like you presented before. But on the other hand, we have no choice. So just let, let those tools get started. And I am not a specialist to know if we should do taxation or regulation. Probably we should do a little bit of everything, but we need really test grounds. Uh, and um, um, what I'm missing as, a, as someone who grew up in Luxembourg is why are we a nation that is so special in not having the courage to do what others are doing? <laughs> What makes us so special to have no courage? It's really, um, yeah, so that, that would be my question. Psychotherapist. Yes, yeah, psychotherapist. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, but meanwhile, can't we try to develop a couple of alternative projects? And I'm, I'm not waiting for this big, you know, powerful guy or girl no, in the politics, you know? A couple of, uh, and I, I allow myself to debate in an intimate circle, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I normally don't do this in public. <laughs> Of course, I mean, that, that was the first pitch. Imagine. So already the idea of this kind of pilots or however you want to call it is getting abused completely. And so either there's an avalanche of potential projects that might be big, small, complex, simple, uh, uh, and ideally the whole range. But then again, I mean, it's, it's, it's an illusion to think that this will happen more or less by itself or by a kind of yeah. commonality, yeah. Yeah. which on an ethical level I completely agree. But on a realistic level, especially in Luxembourg, no. I, I don't see it happen uh, very soon, to be honest. Uh, and when you say, well, why, why don't we have the courage? I think it's very simple because you're in a very comfortable position, whether you like it or not. Uh, I'm from Belgium, there's a little different position, but it's still a very comfortable position. So there's also a lack of courage to really be there. But, but still, again, I, and I don't want to reduce it to egos, I don't, I'm not interested in egos, but you need a couple of people in power in, in the existing system, well, which is people in power, that dare to take certain risks and have some, um, and yes, maybe we can feed them, 
But for, I'm going to give a counter uh, uh, example because maybe I was slightly too blunt, although uh, earlier on. But for instance, at the moment we're working here in Luxembourg City on uh, with, the, with the mayor. Uh, let's see where we arrive. But I have a, uh, and you can agree or disagree. But this is a person who has probably an ego, not to. She says something and she does it. For better or for worse. Uh, I, it's the first, I've been now in Luxembourg for five years, it's the first political person I encountered that has this kind of courage. Because I think there's a courage and you can perfectly disagree because you, you know, uh, you have much more confidence. <laughs> yes. But I come from outside and I see something and I see things moving forward. And uh, where you can test things, like you said, you can test things. We're at the moment, we're starting to prepare to test things. I don't see it happening a lot. You know. For instance, Luxembourg and transition, I sincerely hope that there will be this avalanche <laughs> of projects coming out of it, but I sincerely doubt it. I sincerely doubt it. There was uh, somebody. Um, Coming back on the idea of power and storage, uh, uh, um, and, and then the young generation, and putting in the To the speak a little bit louder. Sorry. Um, I say, coming back on the idea of uh, courage, power, and the young generation, um, the idea of pushing the burden to the young generation, I think, is, is an easy way out. The same way as saying it's the politicians that need to do something. Uh, action and power is very easy. César. Maria. This part now is engaging into the discussion. <laughs> Was only the right part here? Yeah? Now the left. No, it, it has been mentioned words like courage or love thing, having this uh, uh, theme of changing things in some way, I think. Some uh, interesting and even brave question in the case of Luxembourg. I'm really a newcomer here, and I'm really curious to know if there is a kind of if we can say who owns the land in Luxembourg. I think that would be one of the first and fundamental questions towards this, let's say, assault to a potential shift in how land is owned and managed. So if we know who owns the land here, that's, that's, that would be, uh, uh, I think, a very interesting question to pose. And from there, start thinking, <laughs> okay, uh, why don't, let's go to the next level. Uh, it will be test interesting to see uh, the answer to, to this question. Maria. Maria, and then maybe a last one. Yes, okay. Maria. Um, so just uh, uh, after the beginning of the discussion, I think it's also super important to 
person beyond objects and beyond egos, which are very relative and important. I think it's also important that we think of uh, designing and thinking of new roles of architects for ourselves. No strict division between politicians and architects, but really just trying to con configure the new hybrid position of artisan, I would say, slash politician in a way. And I think this also brings us to the question of pedagogy, of how we teach actually this question. So just, yeah. Netanyahu is an architect, you know, trained as an architect, but uh, <laughs> just self joke. Yes. Um, so Ivan. we are concluding right now that it's architects' duty is to act from shadow, trying to affect our clients uh, to implement these concepts. Otherwise, they will just stay theoretical. We don't have actual tools other than that, because most of the architects are acting on uh, exact projects under the exact programs given by exact clients. Mm -hmm. So in this context, we are like Batman's. Uh, <laughs> 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 if you consider basis. an architect as a pure service provider, yes. But people are like, honestly, did someone in this room try to ask uh, some acquaintance what architects are doing actually? Like, uh, on my experience, I was uh, receiving responses like they are, uh, they are ensuring walls to, st to stay properly or like to beams to do of the proper sections or even pipes not to leak. Uh, nothing actually related to our real domain. So people are not really aware of what we are doing. So, so much we complicate our, um, our image that people struggle understanding what we are doing. If they don't understand what we are doing, how can we implement anything? Yes. I think we as architects are just starting to understand how diverse this job can be, and we cannot expect from the public to understand it as well as fast as we are doing it now. So, I am an architect um, who now work as participatory who organize participatory Absolutely. Great. Shall we? Um, f yeah. Last. Maria. Uh, there was a last. No. There yeah, was, but sorry. There was. There has been a law that we voted in September last year that says that the Hotel bars and yeah. for fun. Yeah. Yes. That's a modest step, but at the same time, they put the same volume on the top of the private, you know, feasible project. Buildable space. I'd like to add something uh, on the remarks, or take all the remarks from the most part. Um, I think the, the sociological structure of Luxembourg fundamentally changed during the last 20 years. And what you say doesn't take into account this change. It is true that the, the people who vote in Luxembourg, they are the owners of the land. And, but they represent 20% <laughs> of the they vote in the national elections, but all the residents can vote in the communal elections. So, in fact, the, the change, in my opinion, will come from the communal level, yeah. because there you can address all the population. Yeah. You can address everyone, 
And you can address the politician, because of course, I agree with, with what Peter said, you need the politician, and the, the politician can trigger things. And the communal level is absolutely essential. Nothing is moving, actually, at the moment on the national level, or very, very little is moving there. But the, the, the role you can have as a policy whisperer uh, on the communal level is much, is in my opinion, much bigger and there you can take into account the sociolo sociological change which took place in Luxembourg since, since uh, 20, 30 years. And the, those pe the people of those communities, they are active on the communal level. A lot, I experienced that, not in one country. You can, you can I think it's, it's easy to see, go to the, to, to the fundamental schools in, in Mersch, in, in Stanzel, in Clairvaux, you will notice that. I think, and I think this, what you say is history. I'm, I'm much more positive than that. I, I think it's it's a project, you know. It's it, and it's our project, and it's a political one. As as architects, it's a political project. Of course, you need all the actors, all the stakeholders. So you need the investor, but the investor also needs the comments. And I think this is true in in Zurich. You have the same investors in Zurich that you have here, but the the, the set of rules is a different one. Why? <laughs> Because the, the political prerogative is different. And I think, the, in, in my experience, from my experience, I think you can change much more than you think you can, in fact, on the community level. And, and, some, and some mayors might, might be open if they see that their population is keen for, for, for some developments. But somebody has to tell them. Somebody has to inform them. And somebody has to inform and, and try to find ways to how to to implement and how to in the even in the given frameworks of, of the legal and the regulatory frameworks to make changes. I know that this is possible. I, I made that experience on several projects. Of course, you can say sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Of course, this is true. But you are the architect, and this is your life anyway. So I I, I, I want to. The nice At a given moment, yeah. you should be much more radical. This doesn't mean making radical proposals, but maybe in the end you will end up with a radical proposals, but maybe in the end you will end up with a proposal which is very, like, like, like Metron's proposal. So I, I don't know that, and I think this, that's not the key issue. At the moment, to start with, don't start with that. Start with where are you and what, what do you want to do and who are the people around you? It's not the investor. No, it's everybody. Claude, so yeah, I yeah. have to add a little thing to that. Uh, on the other side, the counterpart, the politician, they have for the time being a politician, they have to be professionals, in my opinion. Uh, a bureaucratic now, for my, it, it comes now mayor. He gets 18 hours per week uh, for everything. School organizations, uh, new projects, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the mayor from Luxembourg may be a strong person because she has always been there. So that's, uh, that's a huge difference. I, I, she's she's uh, radically open to certain things. For instance, very close to it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
was, and again, underpinned by Maybe. certain expertise, which was maybe not hers. Uh, and she also openly stated it, which is already maybe the beginning, kind of the mirror statement of like, uh, I need to be uh, nourished with insights, and then I can still decide because I have the power to decide. Mm -hmm. uh, and I must say, at least in my opinion, that's been one of the freshest uh, examples I've seen in the, in the last uh, couple of years. Life. They're all around, presumably, but uh, they I don't know what's there. So I think it's so, and, and it boils down to a personal stance, which is not an ego in this case. Could be on other levels, but I'm not interested in the ego. Mm -hmm. It's a personal stance, it's a per personal ethics, ethical stance, and uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a really necessary ingredient, whether you like it or not. Right. Shall we? Um, I, I mean, I really, I, I think, first of all, it's nice that the format, <laughs> that the format in this room works, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a debate. I think that is already very nice. I acknowledge, and I think it is, somebody said it, that for the, this is your job, for the next debates, so we have a couple of upcoming debates and inputs, where, where we put in dialogue always actors of best practices or other examples to local expertises. So I acknowledge that we have to invite or even try to force politicians, yes. Yes. maybe developers, I'm not sure about it. Let's try to get also some developers. I think we don't need, but let's... Another. But <laughs> let's try. Let's try this for. But, but I, I really think it's one of the rare. No, I have not seen as many discussions like this one today. But we are maybe too, we too much on the common ground. Let's say. But so it's promising. Uh, well, it's promising. There is a space of opportunity. Ex exactly and. Please, next time it's not like in the class where everybody starts sitting in the back, but we start around the table. Okay, let's go to the bar. Thank you very much.